pretty much. I'll hand it over to Fletch. Hey, Lucas. All right, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Fletcher. I'm a consultant. I like experience with as many business types as I can. So I go to from oil and gas to medical, game design, marketing, uh, electrical, small business, government, military. I, I work in just a whole lot of different places. I move around a lot. Um, I'm currently architecting for a marketing company, and my goal right now is to sort of expand my, my talking schedule so I can do more talking here and other places that I do talking. Um, I specialize in the application of software engineering principles and practices um, in a highly opinion, opinionated Microsoft world, the .NET, and you know, Microsoft wants you to do things their way. Um, my goal is to strip Microsoft's opinions out of everything and sort of move into a taking these principles and practices and solid, solid and everything and sort of apply them in a .NET world since .NET wants you to do things their way, but Java and every other community has a solid sense of principles. Yeah, oh, I guess I can hold it too. Yeah, point toward me. Let me know how that works. Now it's on. Um, so um, this is a walkthrough of advanced regular expressions in general, but focusing on the .NET flavor. Uh, during this talk, I'm not going to try to convince anyone to use regular expressions because regex are horrible and they are almost always a better option than regular expressions, string parsing, and other things. Uh, it's an open forum, so feel free to ask questions, uh, comment, or raise your hand for any reason. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm going to leave out little tidbits. You might notice, hey, that might work a different way, you know, or that's a very narrow case that he's talking about. Um, this talk usually takes about 50 minutes, but I'm going to sort of rush through a couple of little places, maybe skip some things. But if I do skip something that seems interesting to you, let me know. Okay, so. All right, a refresher on some basic patterns and syntax. Um, one character at the top there, that represents one character literally as seen. And so it's case sensitive. Regular expressions are all case sensitive unless you specify otherwise. Uh, a character class, the second line, represents a single character, but with the possibilities it could be anything in that range um, or any list of characters there inside the character class. Uh, repetition, such as the asterisk or the, uh, the curly braces, the curly braces or the asterisk. Uh, repetition, uh, it tells you how many times you want the preceding character or the preceding pattern to be repeated. Um, this example right here matches, matches Merka. Uh, and other forms of America. Uh, character classes can be inclusive, exclusive, or even both. So right here, it's A through Z, lowercase, minus the vowels. So this would, rep this would represent all lowercase consonants. Um, and then there's a lot of different uses for parentheses. Um, parentheses, in this case, is capturing a named group with a pattern LOL in it. And uh, there's, but there's a lot of different other uh, uses for parentheses and capture groups and repetition and um, alternate alteration and all kinds of alternation and all kinds of different ones. Um, so last one, if you see dot asterisk question mark in any of your regular expressions, which I see in a lot of people's regular expressions, it's really hard to see my other text up there. That um, that could be a code smell that that something's wrong. And there's usually a much easier way to optimize that to uh, to get what you're trying to work out of, and I'll go into that later on also. So, what are regular expressions used for? The major use is for input validation. I'm sure everyone here that's worked with regular expressions, that's what you use it for is input validation in fields. Um, patterns with input validation almost always start with a caret and end with a dollar symbol. This is to specify that you are not parsing a document, you are expecting only exactly your match, and there should be nothing before or after your match. The match should begin at the beginning, the match should end at the end, and there's no other considerations. So um, in this example, you have the uh, caret and the dollar sign, so you will match email address.com. You will not match this, even though that text is in there and it should work, or, or it, would, it would work if it didn't have the caret or the dollar sign. So for input validation, when you're doing um, accepting an email address or a phone number or anything else in the field, you're going to be validating whether or not there's an email address in there in this case. And if that returns a true, you're just gonna te take the, te the text of the field at its face value and say, okay, there's an email address there, I'm gonna take it. And you don't wanna do that in that case, so you wanna make sure an input validation and use the caret and the dollar sign. Um, 
When doing input validation, um, it's also very detailed and strict. The point of a pattern for input validation is to limit matches as strictly as possible so users can't input whatever they want all willy-nilly. So um, in this case, you have this whole thing right here is only a piece of the RFC complete email regular expression. So if you're looking for a regex to validate email, that's one little piece of it. It's actually a lot longer than that, about three or four times longer than that. And that's not good, but I'll cover that next or soon. The purpose of input validation is to return a Boolean result. So um, either the pattern is successful or the pattern fails. If a pattern is successful, a developer typically then takes the input and either strips it, takes off you know, um, leading, leading spaces or dashes, or you just use it raw. Um, either way, most of the data will still be there. If you find yourself using capture groups during input validation, then you might consider that your users would have a better experience with simply separate inputs. So in this example, I have a phone number, a phone number regular expression, and it will match these three phone number types. Um, it will not match this phone number because that is not that is not a valid phone number because it begins with a one. The area code begins with a one, and it will not match this because it has a bunch of extra text in it. Um, now, one way that you might see regular expressions is you might see a capture group around the area code and then a capture group around the the rest of the phone numbers if you want to separate those two out during your input validation. But if you have a business rule that's saying to separate those out for some reason then it's something that sort of wants, you want to pop in your head to say, if I'm separating this out in the business rule, maybe I should just separate it out for the customer and make the user experience a little bit better. Um, so in that case, you'd separate it out. You wouldn't even need a regular expression at that point. You just need to see length of three for the area code, length of seven for the phone number. Um, so it's just something that you'd keep in mind if you see, find yourself using capture groups when you're doing input validation. You're not, you should, probably shouldn't be using capture groups in input validation. Um, the other side of the regex coin is data manipulation or data parsing. Uh, data manipulation makes strong use of capture groups um, and other types of uh, parenthetical groups. It has a much looser pattern with fluff patterns and repetition operators. So um, in this case, that little space bar with an asterisk on there is a fluff pattern. You sometimes just see those thrown around inside of the regular expression in case somebody puts one or more spaces where maybe it shouldn't be. Um, and it returns a collection of results with possibly multiple captures. So in this case, if I had a document with probably more text than this, but including first name Peter, last name Capaldi, then a regular expression would be much shorter than that RFC complete regex that I saw, that you saw a second ago. But it would specifically say I want name and I use a capture group to capture one part of it. So there would be usually be an overall regular expression, but one part of it will be the important part that you want to capture. So, any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. Does, uh, does it match on if you have like a character that's like a tilde or uh, like an NDA in uh, Spanish that can get the or a pattern match that? <laughs> a, a pattern can match that, but regex is very literal. The question is, does it match the, um, the N with the symbol above it in Spanish to make it ña? So, um, it, you can match that, but you have to specifically use that. Or if you use the, in this case, the word character, that will match the, the N with a tilde above it or whatever like that. Also on a side note, since we brought that up, this does match all letters, the slash W, but it also matches underscores, uh, which you may or may not want. It's just something to keep in mind. I don't know why they did that. It's letters and underscore for some reason, so. Um. All right, so with data manipulation, you expect to get back one or more matches against a large input. I mean, it's not too large, but this is my input here in the dark, dark color. Um, but in a large input, you expect to get back one or more matches. Um, in this example, we can find all of the actors of a story who have a speaking role. So with that one pattern, which is the colorful looking pattern, the regular expression engine will find a pattern, will find a match, then at the end of the match, we'll begin looking for the next match, starting from the index of wherever it finished the previous match. So in this example, we use the pattern to find everyone where somebody said or replied a, quote, a quoted fr uh, phrase. And we use a capture group to capture the somebody. So in this case, we have um, uh, slash B is a word boundary. We have a capture group to capture any word characters, letters, possibly some spaces, fluff pattern there. And then 
alternation, either said or replied, and then space, comma, space, quotation. So inside the story here, it will pick up crazy face said whatever, or protagonist man replied whatever, and it will capture into this capture group, crazy face and protagonist man. So whenever I get this back in my uh, C sharp, it'll say, I'll have a collection of group one is crazy face, and then group one match two is protagonist man. Um, in some of my code later on, I show little snippets of what the uh, C sharp looks like, but um, just to get through these ideas, uh, I don't put it there. Okay, the first rule of regular expressions is don't use regular expressions. Like I said, I'm not going to try to sell you on regular expressions. Instead, favor string parsing functions. So in this example, um, this, is special, okay, this is especially important when you're parsing hundreds, millions, or hundreds of millions of documents. Uh, if you're getting a whole bunch of Word documents or some information that you're trying to get data out of, then, uh, then you want to really think about cutting down those milliseconds. Um, in this example, I'm measuring the ticks it takes to use a simple regex versus substring math. In reality, I ran this loop thousands of times, um, and the console at the bottom is what the result was. But to fit it on the screen, I took out all the fluff code, all the looping, and everything like that. So at the top, you have what the pattern is, which happens to be HTML. I'm not saying that you should parse HTML with regular expressions. Sometimes it's necessary, but usually not. Um, first thing I do here is I have the uh, regular expression pattern to get any, any text out of the TD tags. And here at the bottom, I just find the TD tags and the substrings of them, and I get out to math to find what the indexes are and get out the ability there. And you can see that it is very dramatic, the speed of it. And this goes into another point I make a little bit later on that it may be really quick to write a quick regex, but if you're trying to speed up some time, you might, might want to take some time and write a, up to like a 10, 20 line function that's doing a whole bunch of math on substrings and finding exactly what you want because that will make your program run a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. All right, recognize when you truly do need a pattern. If you're simply using alternation, you just use some index of or contains function in C-sharp. It may end up being more than one line, perhaps even using indexes to count how many instances of the alternation there is. But it may be better to take more time to write a string function than doing a regex, which takes 100 times longer to process. That's what I just said. Uh, if you're simply looking for text or between two markers to find the text between two markers, definitely use a string function. Um, there are a lot of regexes I see parsing things that are looking, using alternation like this. It'll find word, this, alternation, et cetera, um, these different instances. Or like the example I had previously, which I shouldn't use that as an example, I guess. I'm saying it's bad here. but um, And then between two, two markers, in this case, the uh, brackets for HTML, finding everything that's not, it's much easier to use um, or much faster to use uh, string functions. The second rule of regex is do not use regular expressions. <laughs> I know this is a regex talk, but I'm still going to say this. Um, if we think for a moment about what a user might type into an email address field, we, I can think of four possibilities. In an email address field, they'll type their actual email address, if you're lucky. Um, they might type a fake email address that looks like a real email address, like asdf at asdf.asdf. They might just run their face across the keyboard and get some characters in there. or um, they could mistake the field for something else, like the social security number, the name. They might think they're in a different field and actually be typing something else in there. So those are the four instances that I can think of. Um, the only way to validate email is to send someone an email, have them click a link that has a token on it, and then when it returns back, you say, okay, they put in a valid email, you know, I can actually email this person. So if it's important for you to validate email, do it that way, send them an email, get it back. If it's not important, then why are you validating the field anyway? Um, so once again, that's what an email regex, part of an email regex would look like. What I suggest in, instead is doing an index of at, just to make sure there's an at in there. And that way you're, you're ruling out someone putting in gibberish or putting in accidentally the social security number or the name, which doesn't have an at symbol. I don't think it's legal to put an at symbol in a name. Um, both of those examples will successfully match Mr. The Fletch at business.com. But that isn't a real email address. Don't email that email address. It's not real. Um, the only way to validate email is to send, send an re email receipt test. So uh, in that example, just, I just don't use regex. All right, rule third, the third rule. Be explicit, explicit with spacing. Uh, there's a, 
There's a way to debug regular expressions so that you can actually put regular expressions on multiple lines. Like this at the bottom here, you can actually put it on multiple lines, have all this space here. And then if you use a, a regular expressions option, like the question mark X, then um, it'll actually ignore all white space. So if you're in your actual pattern, you're putting space bar spaces, then that'll break your pattern. Um, and this is maybe not that interesting here in that fault, very small example, but whenever you're writing a longer email uh, regex, right, writing longer e regex that is like 30, 40 characters long or 10 lines long, and you want to break it down by lines to sort of debug it and look at the different parts, then you're going to want to be able to do that. So uh, long story short, if you use the character class with a space in it, it does not ignore that. It will say in the character class there's a spacebar space, so let's go ahead and just use that as a spacebar space. Um, the slash s for white space matches space bars, vertical, uh, vertical tabs, horizontal tabs, line breaks. Uh, a lot of times you don't, you're not meaning to match that. So if you're just trying to say uh, fluff pattern, we want to ignore spaces here or allow people to put spaces here. We don't care about that in the pattern. Putting a slash s will a lot of times break you because it's going to be getting more information than you need. Um, and don't ever use a plain space. All right, um, the fourth rule of regular expressions is that the dot is evil. I know it doesn't sound like a rule, but I'm going to make it a rule. Uh, the dot is a special character which represents anything except for line breaks, unless you use a, uh, there's a regular expression option, which is question mark S, and that will make the dot match literally everything, even line breaks. Uh, alone, the dot is just an ugly but harmless tool, but with the power of a repetition operator, which is uh, one of these repetition operators, the star or a plus, or a question mark, then uh, it gets very greedy or very, very lazy. So the first example up there of those three examples of sesquipedalian is uh, greedy. So the dot followed by an asterisk or a plus will match everything it can, which is literally everything except for line break. And the second example it is very lazy. The dot could get everything, but it would rather go play well. In the third example, it's as lazy as it can be, but after the, uh, after the star question mark, I say, at least get to the Q. At least get as far as the Q. So it'll get, uh, find the S, okay, I'll get the E, S. But once it gets to the Q, it says, all right, I'm done, I'm out of here. So um, you can make it lazy, but by default, um, reg expressions operators are greasy, gre greedy. They are also greasy. <laughs> so is the pizza. So, um, a dot alone, this is an example of just a dot, it will match only one character. Uh, in this example, I'm just making a note, um, sort of just a note for, for your information, that after a regex pattern does a match, it has the index at the end of the match and it'll say, let's look for the match again. And it will continue looking for the match multiple times. So in this case, a dot actually, um, it actually matches for over 40 matches. So it's not just matching what you can see, but there's something called zero width characters, such as beginning of a word is a character in regex, a zero width character. The beginning of the line is zero width and a few other zero width characters. So there's a whole bunch of matches. Um, I'm not covering, I'm not gonna go into that detail in my future examples. I sort of ignore future matches. I just go into what it matches one time. Uh, I'm just bringing that to your attention. So with a greedy operator, such as the asterisk or the plus symbol, the dot matches everything it can, which is literally everything except line breaks. So the asterisk, in this case, matches zero to infinite matches, but it will favor infinite because it's greedy. So in this case, dot star, the asterisk is greedy. It can match zero to infinite, but it says, I'm gonna match infinite, so it matches the entire match. The plus operator is very similar, but it matches one to infinite matches. And, uh, and so in this case, since it's greedy, because it is greedy, it will favor the infinite over the one. And the same thing with a question mark. If you use a question mark, which is zero or one, it just makes the preceding, uh, the preceding pattern optional. It will favor one, because uh, by default, these operators are greedy. So um, in the case of the asterisk and the plus, the entire string is matched. In WoW, we call this a ninja looter, and rolling neat on everything, even if you don't need it. Okay, in order to make a greedy operator lazy, you need to add a question mark. So uh, note that the asterisk, asterisk is already optional because it's zero to infinite, but with the question mark at the end of it, 
the question mark actually changes it to laziness, which makes it favor the lesser number. So in this case, it makes, it, it makes the asterisk favor zero instead of infinite. All right, uh, note here that none of the result is highlighted in that result line, only match the U until U. None of it's highlighted. Um, that isn't for lack of success. In reality, there's about 44 successful matches here. First, it starts off and says, okay, I'm at the beginning. Can I match something? Yeah, I can match the O, but I'm too lazy. I'm not going to. But then it goes past the O and says, can I match something? Yeah, I can match the N, but I'm too lazy to do it. It's so lazy that it's not going to match anything at all. If I add a requirement of match at least to the U, put a lowercase u on that, then what it does is it'll step through one at a time, as lazily as possible, and it'll say, okay, let's look at the next thing. Is that a U? Let's look at the next thing. Is that a U? Over and over until it finds the lowercase u, and then it says, okay, I found a match. I'm done. I'm out of here. All right. Without a question mark, the repetition operator is very greedy, and it goes too far. So in this case, uh, I'm putting a constraint of a lowercase u. So it will match to the very end. And then once it gets to the very end, it looks for a u. And it says, I, I went too far. I don't see a u here. So it'll backtrack in this case. Instead of stepping forward one at a time, it'll step backward one at a time and say, let's step backward until I find a u. And so uh, once it finds a u, then it'll consider that the match. So which is more correct? In these cases, when it was trying to find the U, um, the lazy one was more correct because it found the first U in the word until. It started from the beginning, it found the first U into the word until. And um, so it was actually faster. It found the U in until, and then it was done. Um, but what if we're in a large document and the word until, or whatever our match was, could be anywhere in the document? If we knew where the word that we're looking for was, we wouldn't need a regular expression to begin with. So we can't really figure out if the word that we're looking for is early in the document or late in the document? Should we be lazy? Should we be greedy? Which direction should we go? Um, neither one's faster since we shouldn't know where our match is going to be in the document. Um, so going back to on topic uh, of the fourth rule, which is get rid of the dot. The dot is evil. So um, the problem here isn't the laziness or the greediness, but, what, but you do want to favor being greedy, just selectively greedy. So in this case, we get rid of the dot and instead have this pattern of find everything that's not a U multiple times, greedy. There's no question mark after that um, asterisk. And since there's no question mark, that'll be greedy. It'll just find everything that's not a U in one jump. It'll say everything's not a U, okay, as greedy as possible. And then it'll look for a lowercase U and then the word, and then until. So uh, be greedy, but don't use a dot, be optionally greedy. So this is more efficient, even in a large document, finding just jumping until from U to U or whatever pattern to whatever pattern greedily. Just not using a dot is the key. The dot is evil. If you have a dot in your regular expression, then you're evil. So, all right, to capture or not to capture, that is this title. Uh, are there any questions about the previous parts so far? I try to rush through the beginning a little bit for sake of time, but no, okay. All right, so you can use named capture groups or unnamed capture groups to capture the flag or pattern. People also use parentheses for alternation, repetition, um, other things like that. Um, let's see here. These are some of the most common uses of parentheses. Uh, both of the top two will capture. This will capture into a numbered, uh, a numbered group. This will capture it into a named group called name. This will just simply not capture. You can do whatever you want in it. Uh, it's a question mark colon, and it will not capture. Uh, so you could like, put an asterisk at the end of this group after your pattern, and it will uh, it'll repeat multiple times, but it will not waste all your capture groups. Um, the never look back. This will not capture, and it will also not go back. So in those other cases where I was saying it will go too far greedily and then step back into things and look step back and look forward, step back and look forward. Once this group is completed, it will never do a backtrack into this group. Um, it, it might have some alternation, or not alternation, some repetition inside of it, but, but once it gets out of the group and it has a match, it will never go back into the group. And then these are uh, look arounds. Look ahead, negative look ahead, look behind and negative look behind, which I'll cover here on the next slide. Actually, I'm gonna skip 
the regular captures because I need to save some time here. It's a tarp. All right, so this is a weird thing that may, may interest you. The, um, for zero length assertions for look arounds, what actually happens in this look around right here, this look ahead, this is a question mark equals, which means it's gonna look ahead and look for this <laughs> pattern. Um, what happens is the index or the, the cursor of the regex match stays in the same place the entire time it does not progress. But a temporary cursor is created for this look ahead that says, uh, look for everything that's not a lowercase t, so it'll actually jump up pretty far. And then the world will end, so it'll jump through that pretty quick. And then when it gets to the end, it just returns a Boolean. It says, okay, look, there was a match, and then the whole thing just disappears. Nothing's captured, uh, the index doesn't move, the index stayed right here the entire, the, the cursor stayed here the entire time. And then from there, it begins the real pattern, which is everything that's not a period multiple times greedy. So it just captures the whole thing. So in a look ahead, when you use the question mark equals, the, the, in, the cursor stays in the same exact place, the look ahead continues, and then um, the cursor, at the end of the look ahead, it takes over from where the cursor was left off, and it continues the pattern. But the super interesting one is the look behind. For the look behind, um, the regex engine will actually skip the look behind altogether and find the first real part of a pattern that isn't a look around. It will find the uppercase I and say, it'll first find it here and then say it does not say desire before it. But then it'll find the I here and say, okay, let's begin the pattern. It will actually first find all spaces, which is there's one space, and then it will find a comma, and then it will look for E, R, I, S, E, D, erised, which is that's the mirror of erised. Um, it'll actually find it backwards. So it, it evaluates your pattern backwards. It's weird, but it works really weird. And then it returns a Boolean, like all look arounds do. It'll return a Boolean that it'll drop its temporary cursor. The whole thing will disappear and say, hey, true, I found it. And then that cursor from the original pattern stays right where it was and will continue ahead looking for, in this case, anything that's not a period until the end. So um, for the case of look arounds, it does not move your cursor, it just looks backwards. So that's an interesting use, you may be able to use that. All right, this slide is called Conditional Love. This is a picture of Link and Asana from Sword Art Online. It is blasphemy, and my regex pattern here proves that. Regular expressions can indeed use conditionals. It almost makes you think that regular expressions can be Turing complete, but they are not. Unfortunately, regex cannot perform mathematical computations, even though it can simulate logic, as these conditionals show. So, no one should ever think that you can use regex as a programming language. It's just a regular engine with flavors, in this case, .NET. You can use conditionals and some other, um, some other flavors you can use conditionals. So, on here you have, um, you have what you have is a, Parentheses, and then right inside of the print, right inside of the parenthetical group is another set of parentheses with your conditional. And the first pattern outside of that is the N. You have alternation, and then the else. So um, back referencing, back referencing is somewhat required for conditionals, and it's also a cool tool that you can use anyway. So in this case, if I'm capturing inside of this capture group A B, and then I say also capture slash one. That will find A, B, A, B, because since I captured A, B, it will then again look for whatever I captured in that capture group. And in this case, I'm catching any digit, 0 through 9, slash 1. So this will find any digit, could be an 8, for example, and whatever I capture in there, it will look for that 8 again. So it doesn't, it doesn't duplicate the pattern, but it duplicates the results of the pattern. So this will find 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, or whatever the case may be. So for conditionals, I could say, I'm going to capture whatever the first word of a sentence is, link or kirito. And then I will say, conditionally, if this look behind, if what I do in a look behind is I found the word link, then capture and Zelda. Otherwise, capture and asana. So you will get either link or Zelda or link and, or kirito and asana. You will never see link and asana. I just want to make a very clear point about that. Okay. So any questions on um, how conditionals work? 
I have a question since this is, I never asked this question. Has anybody ever used a conditional prior to this or even knew that it was possible? Yeah, it's pretty neat. If you, if you use regular expressions at all, once every few months or whatever, then definitely play with conditionals because it gets you all kinds of flexibility in your regular expressions. All right. Stacks are cool. I know this because Spock knows this. Any Star Wars fans here? No. <laughs> Hey, there it is. <laughs> it was a trap. It's a tarp. So, no, seriously. Um, does anybody here need a quick refresher on what a stack is in programming? Quick refresher? Or does anybody not know what a stack is? I do not. You do know what a stack is, okay. Okay, so um, let me just go past that and say, in regular expressions, capture groups are actually stacks. They're not static variables. So if you have the same capture group name multiple times in the same pattern, each time a capture is done into that capture group, it is not appended to the value of the capture, it's pushed to the value of the capture. So you can peak, uh, you can push, peak, and pop from the stack during, during the pattern. Uh, another thing that might confuse you for programming is not programming. Um, but at the end of the pattern, once the pattern's complete and it returns you to your C sharp, it will actually only return the peak. The stack is lost, you, can, you can't look at what the stack was, but you can use the stack during the pattern. Uh, all right, so in this case I have cook. I, I cook flapjacks, eat flapjacks. So um, talking about that back reference that I was talking about before where you can reference the results of whatever a capture was. In this case I'm saying cook, and in the pancake, um, capture group, I'm, I'm capturing flapjacks, comma, eat, and this is a back reference also looking for <coughs> flapjacks. So once this, once this outer group here completes successfully and finds the word flapjacks, this negative pancake actually pops the stack of pancake. So when you get down here in your C sharp, you would see um, the result is regex.groups pancake, and I'm referencing the pancake name group, that value is actually empty. Even though I captured something called flapjacks here, since I popped the stack here, it would actually end up being empty. All right, a real regular expression and breakdown. How many know time, Matt? Good time? Okay. All right, so um, in, in this text here, if I had all this text uh, or a whole bunch of text inside of a document, um, and I have a whole bunch of phone numbers, I'm trying to capture phone numbers out of a document, this regular expression will catch these proper phone numbers. This isn't proper because it's just a, a set of numbers that begins with a one um, with no area code. And this isn't proper because it's 12 digits. So let me come over here. What I'm doing here is I'm doing a look behind, which I'll get into later, looking for digits and spaces behind uh, my capture. And the first thing I'm looking for is an optional one. Maybe I'm not going to require someone puts a one or even an area code in my phone number, but someone could start a phone number with a number one and a little fluff pattern for some spaces. And then I'm going to capture into the open paren group and open parentheses for the area code. And this is optional also because someone might not even have an area code, let alone parentheses. So this is a conditional of the parentheses and inside, directly inside, another set of parentheses, which is naming a capture group. So this is naming the country code. So this is saying if something was pushed to this stack, if the stack of variables for country code had a match pushed to it, then area code is required. In this case, I'm matching area code and putting a match inside of there. Otherwise, the same pattern, but making it optional. So if someone put a one, then it has to be followed by an area code. You don't just put a one and then a local phone number. So one area code, or if there is no one, they could still be putting an area code. You don't have to have a one to put an area code. So, um, so this conditional is complete after that. This is another conditional saying if open paren had something pushed onto its stack, so if this matched up here and said, uh, and I actually captured an open parentheses, so if open paren was pushed to a stack, then require a closed parentheses. And this also demonstrates that you don't need the else portion of a conditional. Um, you could just stop at the, um, with the then portion. Possibly some spaces, a um, little fluff pattern. And then, of course, I captured the local phone number, which is just the, the prefix, which cannot start with a one. It's just two through nine. Two through nine, two other digits, and then the last four. 
So um, these two patterns are very useful, this look ahead and this look behind, because otherwise this pattern would successfully match some random seven digits in here as a phone number, and it would match seven digits, and then it would say, hey, look, there's some numbers before and after that. There shouldn't be numbers before and after that. If so, I'm not looking at a real phone number. In this case, it matches seven digits and says, okay, there's no digits before or after it. I'm done. It's successfully a phone number. But if there's like an ID or some other type of uh, account number or something in the, in, the, um, in the document that you're reading, you don't want it to match. Yeah, sure, there's seven digits in here. There's lots of iterations, of possibly, possibilities of seven digits in here. But it's not a phone number because there's, there were then, after the match, would be either digits before or after they were left over. So after this main match finishes, the look behind looks behind the starting of the match and says, okay, there's no digits there. It's a negative look behind with the, the um, exclamation point. And this negative look ahead says, okay, there's no digits there. And so the match would pa match successfully. So this is a case where you're using the, um, the stack and then the conditionals checking the stack to see if anything's on the stack. Um, this would also, by the way, return true if I had captured, fi pushed 15 things to this stack. It would also return true. But if there were zero things pushed to the stack, or if I popped the stack enough times that it was zero things left on the stack, then this return would return false. So this is an actual, this is actually what I use for phone numbers whenever I'm trying to pull phone numbers out of a document. Um, any questions on that? Or is there anything I can clear up? All right. Nice. All right. In this instance, there are two capture groups pushing to the same stack. And there is one parenthetical group popping from the name stack upon a successful match of the pattern inside. So the result of push, the result that push and me and are both pushed, but me and is popped, only leaving push on the stack. So in that case, whenever I capture the word push, that is pushed to the stack. And then I capture me and, that is also pushed to the stack. And then I capture pop me, and that is pulled from the stack. And so this is sort of a, a, an example of what happens to pop me. Well, nothing happens to pop me. It is matched, it is successfully matched, and it is not put into, it is not pushed onto the stack. The fact that it is successfully matched means that this stack gets popped because of that negative sign. So, um, so if I do my uh, C sharp here, and I find what the, uh, the value of the group stack is, the value will be pushed, even though I captured push and uh, me and. So that's the way that the stack works. All right, this is another way to de demonstrate the stack, the stack of a capture group. Um, does anybody want to take a shot at saying what any of these are? Anyone want to look at them? The first one's fairly obvious. The first one just captures stack onto the stack. And then the rest could be sort of a fun little thing to look at. Um, all those really light colors just say the name of the stack, which is A. Um, it's not really part of anything. So does anyone want to take a shot at regex 2 at least to tell me what the stack, what would be on the stack after pushing S, pushing TA, and popping CK? That's all right. So um, in the first example, since it pushed twice and popped once, oh, never mind. That's, uh, I can't even read it myself. Um, next time, I'll make that darker. So it actually pushed three times. So since the third push is CK, CK is on the stack. The second one pushes once, and then pushes TA, and then pops once. So it popped off the TA, and S is what's left. Um, the, the important part that I'm trying to get at this, at this slide is that here, there's an order of operations. First, just like, just like mathematic, mathematics, inside it's going to be doing, it's going to do the inside first, which pushes CK to the stack. And then it does a pop once it gets to the outer one. So it just pops CK off the stack again. So in this case, you're going to have TA. You push S, push TA, push CK, but then pop CK. So you go back to TA. And similar to this one, with this one, push S, push TA, and then it'll push C and pop C, and then it'll do another pop, so it pops off TA, and you're left over with S. So um, what's the value of all this? Um, I guess before I get the value, I talk about these regex um, options. Uh, these regex options, I mentioned a little bit before, if you place, like in this example down here, if at the front you can push, you can put a regex option, that means A through Z, even though that's lowercase, will also match uppercase. And you see um, regex options, 
you put an option here, and if you had multiple options, such as i and x, you just put i, x inside of the same parentheses. But the reason why that's cool is because I can say case insensitive, and then a through z, and some spaces, and then I can turn it off again. I can say I want the rest of the regex from here forward to be case sensitive. You put a minus i, and it'll make the rest of it sensitive. So you can have partially sensitive and partially case insensitive regular <laughs> expressions with these regex options. Um, ignore case, multi-line, single line, explicit comments. Um, I don't want to get too deep into those. But I will get into this crazy random happenstance, which is the, the pinnacle of this talk. Um, by the virtue of that stack and all the stack stuff I was talking about, the .NET regex flavor has the ability to do balancing groups. Um, only the .NET flavor supports balancing groups, but JGSoft might support balancing groups in the future. It has yet to do so. And what that does is it gives you the ability to do this, which you never could in any other regex. Uh, if I have this text, if I have this text here, and I just want to find this text in the middle, assuming this was on one line and I didn't cheat and just look for the second line, um, then what you'd have to do is find an opening parentheses and then find a closing parentheses. But that would only get you that far, text, more text. So how many closing parentheses do you look for? You don't know unless you count how many opening parentheses there are at first. So as I explained down here in the bottom, you may start with one, two, subtract, so that's one, two, three, two, one, zero. So you can balance the groups and find nesting uh, with balancing groups in .NET regex. So in this case, I have a balancing group regular expression like this, and I will explain it, of course. All right, so um, in this case, I start with uh, the regex option X, and that is the regex option that allows me to have multiple lines here, lots of spaces, but it's not gonna match those spaces um, because it has the X option, so that allows free spacing, and that's another reason why I said earlier, don't put spaces because it'll break your regex. If you wanna put a space, use the character class. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do inside of the aptly named D uh, capture group um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for an opening parentheses. And then in this conditional right here, it says if, and then in the parentheses I say the name group D. If D had something pushed to it, it had, which it does, it should have one push to it at this point. I'm pushing that one, that one uh, opening parentheses. If D has something pushed to it, then use this alternation right here. Um, now, you see, a, you see a pipe right here, but this is actually all the then, because it's inside of this group. So the then do this group right here. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for one of these three options. I'm going to look for um, a closing parentheses. And if I find a closing parentheses, I'm going to pop the stack on my D. So um, if I did that right away, then I would have zero and I'd be done. But I don't find a closing parentheses after the first opening uh, parentheses. What I, what I do then instead is I look for another opening parentheses. If I find another opening parentheses at some point, it will push it onto the stack, and then the stack will have two or more, depending on how far along you are. I'll have two things on the stack. But if it's not finding that, if it's just finding text, which is it is finding text, then it will just gather everything that's not a parentheses until the next parentheses. And this is lazy. Um, as you can see from the question mark, which I explained earlier, it is repetition. It will repeat this group in a loop over and over, looking for the next iteration lazily, which means after it goes through and it finds one time, it checks D and says, is there something on the stack? Is there something on the stack of D? If there is, then do an automatic negative look ahead, which will, no matter what, in any regex, it'll automatically fail. So if there's something on the stack, fail. It'll fail and it'll say, well, Let's not fail yet. Let's backtrack into this group and do another iteration. So it'll look for opening parentheses. It'll find text. It'll do another iteration. It'll find opening parentheses pushed out to the stack. It'll find text. It'll find a closed parentheses and pop that from the stack. It'll find text, et cetera, et cetera. It'll go through this multiple times and continuously fail until it gets to the very end where it finally finds the very last print, uh, closing parentheses. It'll pop it off, and then the value of D will have nothing left on the stack. And when value D has nothing left on the stack, it says, okay, this is a success. 
So let's go ahead and get out of here. It'll, it'll leave the regex. The regex is complete, the pattern's done, and it will finish um, finding the balancing group. So you will be able to match um, nested text. This is really good whenever you're doing, um, writing a mathematical application that will take nesting and order of operations and you need to pull things out of it. Um, of course, there's other things, HTML and other weird things, or XML, uh, which by the way, use HTML agility pack or something like that when you're parsing HTML, if possible. But um, in this case, um, this regex, .NET flavor regex is the only flavor that can do balancing groups. It can look for nested, nested um, symbols or patterns. In this case, it's just one symbol, the parentheses, and then a closing parentheses, but you could also do other more complex patterns than that. So any questions on balancing groups? All right, some crazy stuff you can do with .NET. A lot of information I know for only 45 minutes of talking, but um, any questions at all in general for everything? It's only in .NET, yeah. yeah. Soon to be possibly JGSoft, but only .NET as of right now. Yeah. Good? Yep. What was your use case for the, the thing? That use case was nothing, but my use case that I've used it for was HTML. In the case of when I was parsing HTML, it was because we were taking um, bits of HTML that were malformed and then just take from some index to some random index and it was throwing it into a, a document. So there was like, it, there, it's not HTML anymore. It's a bunch of tags and some of the tags are correct. If there's no way HTML agility pack could turn it into XML and, and parse it. So we were doing a lot of that and then finding different parts. So um, that was my use case for it. But I, I personally, whenever I was learning balancing groups, I learned it by writing a little calculator which would parse out, um, parse out some math and, and do the math like that. So. Good. Thank you, guys.